So welcome all and thank you very much for dialing in to our first CIGA MGN Speed Protection and Automation webinar. Today we have the pleasure of welcoming Ben Haynes, Senior Engineer, Secondary Circuits at Osgrid, who is presenting on the implementation of engineering systems in Osgrid's North Sydney Zone substation. Ben started his power systems protection career with Railcorp in New South in Sydney in 2003, where he looked after the protection systems and dedicated 66, 33, and 11 kV AC systems and the 1500 volt DC traction supply for the railway. In 2007, he joined Dereva TD, which later became Schneider, one of their service engineers, providing fully engineered protection systems as well as SAT and SAT testing. In 2010, Ben joined. Energy Australia, now Osgrid, who had started ramping up a large capital program and its journey into IEC 61850. Today, as Osgrid's senior engineer of secondary systems, Ben manages the secondary systems design drawing office with seven designers across Sydney and Newcastle. His team delivers all of Osgrid's secondary systems and circuits. Circuit designs to meet multi multi million dollar capital and replacement programs. So without further ado, I will hand over to Ben and can I please ask everyone to put in voice on island, please, because on mute, because we have a bit of background noise right now. All right. Hello everybody. Um thank you, Alex. And I just want to thank you for the opportunity to um I guess share our um, our outcomes from our design process of implementing 61850. Um, when we initially got asked to um, be involved with the CPAC conference, we were asked if we could do a site visit with um, one of the US designs. Um, North Sydney was one of the latest ones, uh, and I was involved with that uh, from the start. I also thought I'd put together this presentation just to give a, a I guess, an, an option, a background into how we came up with our solution, why we did it. Because there's a lot of presentation from vendors and the like of the world is the, for the with the full world of possibilities. Um, everything can talk, everything can communicate, everything can do everything. But um, now sitting down, thinking about it, working through the engineering process and what we came up with. So, <clears throat> like starting from the start, um, why did we do 61x50? Um, we to um, to reduce our dependence on a single supplier, 61850 is an independent standard, an open protocol, uh, not locked into any proprietary functions. Um, we wanted to get all the benefits that everyone has about from 61850 using the I.O. on the real end. So, um, we wanted to use I.O. and actually um, get that communicating directly to the SCADA system. The other advantage is the isolation between panels. We wanted to be, get that fiber connection between panels rather than the, all the cross connections or all the small wiring. Um, if, you, if you think about it, there's a lot of these benefits you can get from even from DMP3 these days. So we have option at the start of this process. Do we want to go to the DMP3? Do we want to go to 61850? And we looked at these options because at the time, Osgrid hasn't, hadn't even moved away from hard wide schemes. Um, and we decided to jump to 61850 primarily for the um, the goose the ability for the relay devices to talk peer to peer. That's the real underlying um, reason why we jumped to 61850 rather than just go to the MP stage. And on North Sydney itself, um, it's a suburb, what we call suburban substation. Um, so the is roughly as you see it here. Three, Right in minus one arrangement. Um, on cavity feeders, so it supplies the central, the second CBD, I guess, for Sydney, the North Sydney side of the harbour. Uh, so at this stage, we started looking at how we get, what implementation are we going to do. Um, we either within 61850, and we decided on the select before operate controls. Um, reporting for all the digital statuses in the substation, and reporting for the analog. We, we didn't really care whether the currents were high, a few amps higher or lower in the last few seconds. 
seconds if we missed a, a packet or information coming through. What really added to the operators was what the currents are now. We also added on, um, we've got full uh, fault record file transfer through 61850 as well from the relay. Back to the local um, RTU, SMU, um, and that's then transferred to head office through it's available um, in Within 15 minutes, the synchronization happens, so that's fully available through anyone in the company through a web page. Um, just mentioned under frequency load shedding through B2P -peer goose messaging as well. After sort of doing a high level concept of what we're going to use and what different application, we then start to, like, we wanted to, we don't want to change the fundamentals of protection. People have been designing protection systems for uh, hundreds of years with the power network. There's a lot of people, there's a reason why we have things the way they are. Being a new technology doesn't mean we need to throw all that out the window and think about that. So our protection designs, a key requirement is the isolation between A and B systems. We prefer two fully independent schemes rather than a highly redundant cross-connected duplicated scheme. Um, different companies have different approaches to that, but that's how we intern process on that. Um, we will still be prov provable with reasonable outages. Again, when you start cross-connecting a lot of devices, you start having to think about what that device is in or out of service or linked in with something else. How can I test the scheme as a whole? So we still want the scheme to be provable. We want to avoid the vendor-specific features, so we're not locked into anything in the future. We want to use the open parts of the standard. Um, and we just walk through it that follow similar design rules that we've used within the organization for a long time. Other part, it's often, um, about 50, we start talking internets, we start talking the internet of things, and everyone very quickly starts cross-connecting devices. And fundamental design was to, tr to make sure that didn't happen. Um, and it leads up to, yeah, obviously that's the step of A and B is our big, um, thing in the organization. We don't wire A relays into B relays. It's a separate DC schemes. Um, same communications networks. We don't run overlapping rings. Um, in our sort of feed line diff protection schemes, we prefer the folded ring with an extra path. So there, you get a complete outage on one scheme, but you know definitely that the other scheme hasn't been impacted. Um, more details of that in the actual paper that I think got sent around along with this meeting invite. Questions, feel free to ask. Um, that, that's the, one of the big challenges of that in maintaining that segregation between A and B is the subtrans reclosing. Reclosing the high voltage lines, you've got A and B protection schemes. One relay may pick up a fault that shouldn't be reclosed on, and the other feeder, the other protection may have a fault, see a fault that should, uh, would allow reclosing on. How do you allow those devices to communicate without cross connecting those schemes? Again, and we see 61850 being helpful in that regard, and I'll explain that a bit more later on. So one of the big first questions you come to when you start a 61850 line is you've got your standard protection designs, your standard wiring fairly. It doesn't change a lot from that. The does is new is the, um, the network design. So the full view of the Protect the network architecture we came up with. To sort of explain, essentially down the bottom, you've got A and B protection network. Um, this, you hear them essentially mirrored of each other. Um, the session is enforced by the firewall and router between the two networks. And the firewall actually separates that from an overall network, which is sort of the, it's the control network, the SCADA network. And that's um, RTB SMU, as we call them, live in the subsession. To allow the information from the A and B network to allow the, all that information, all the protection reports, all the analog to be reported up to a up to without the segregation rules. Um, we think it'll actually it'll help our sub reclosing philosophy because the control devices that'll actually implement the reclosing can live on the control network. So the relays can see all the events on the network that happen as they, as they do. 
attackers um, events to the control network, and the reclosing device that's independent of both the A and B protection networks can then make its decision about the reclosing. You don't have to cross, don't have to send any messages between the A or B. You don't have to cross connect any of the wiring. You get it all done through optically isolated fiber paths, so you've got no electrical connection between them either. Um, this is well, it's actually a very good fit for the way the 61850 standard has been written. The Goose Messaging, it's a layer two protocol, a MAC address based. It's not translated by firewalls or, or sorry, by routers. Um, so any messaging that's happening between relays that's a protection level function, it will stay on the protection network. It'll be blocked by the um, router. It won't get out of this network without any specific configuration changes. MS reports, uh, the reporting, you know, unbuffered reporting, the risk when they send those, that is a routable protocol. It's a layer three protocol. It actually can be translated naturally by the router. So when the protection has an, receives an event, it sends its trip alarms, that, that message goes through the protection network, it's translated by the router, and then forwarded on, on to the um, RTU. It's very neatly with the, the way the 61850 standard's been written. And for um, yeah, for the the closing will be handled by having those controllers on the control network as well. Sydney, um, it's an 11 kV uh, zone with 11 kV feeders out into the network. So part of a big part of that was actually coming up design for these 11 kV feeders. Um, Five, we don't have 45 feeders in the substation. We want to use the um, control panel space that's on the switchgear itself. Not a change to fixed pattern switchgear for us, so um, um, reduce the instrument control panel space on the switchgear considerably. And we were trying to fit all relays and all the associated functions onto there. Um, so when we um, did the design, we wanted to use as much functionality within the protection relays themselves to make the best use of that space. Um, and it's also cost, very cost sensitive because of 45 panels. Any extra devices you've had suddenly multiplies out very quickly. So um, but using the eye on the relays is that the relays are on the panels themselves. So you've got that short wiring from the pallet statuses or, or um, any other indications locally. And then from there, they're reported through 61850 back to the RTU, saving that wiring. And the art of the design for us was actually implementing arc flash protection. So just to touch on a bit of protection, in a, we're talking about um, communications protocols. Part of that is, to, is a safety improvement for us. We're trying to get um, bus bar faults or faults in the cable terminations off as quick as possible. And it's implemented with our trying to meet the requirements of the NERs for um, primary and backup protection. So we have two protection relays um, into the, the double bank feeder on the, the um, far right. There's one protection relay on each leg, on the outgoing legs, and then there's a, a, a back protection relay that's on the summated part of the 11 kV feeder there. After all that pass, we wanted to also make sure we had the, um, we contain this scheme into the future. One thing we've always had within Osgrid is the ability to um, the controls and the whole functionality of the SCADA system via a hardwired positive. It allowed us, if you have a problem with the SCADA system, you can de-energize the positive and um, it prevents SCADA from acting on anything in the substation and it also allows you to test it. So if you want to upload a new configuration to your SCADA system, you can disable the control positive, upload the configuration and test that. Now that's well in a hardwired scheme, but there's also, now we've got the 61850, they've got the RTU talking directly to a relay, and relays have got the controls and that is within the relay itself. No path is it um, influenced by hard wiring. So you provide a testable scheme in that example. We can accept of the um, broadcast message that goes out to all the devices, so wired positive is removed from the substations as that are looking at, a, um, at the control directly from the SCADA system. Also monitor a, um, a goose message which is published to mimic that hardwired stuff. So if a relay receives um, 
command from the starter system when it should have been, when, when it's all been isolated. So we'll then arm and say, I would have done something if it had been the right situation, but I know that I've been told to prohibit any functions, so I haven't changed state. An example is things like feeder reclosing or the like, or SES functions, auto, non-auto. If someone's testing the data system, you don't want them toggling auto, non-auto, and then leaving it in the wrong state from when the operators or what it should have been. This is to test the SCADA system, put a new SCADA configuration in, toggle that control. The relay will, will report that it changed state and that everything in the relay is programmed correctly. It's just it hasn't acted on that because it knows it should have been isolated. Um, into making that functionality work in the background. Um, argued to be a little bit like a test mode, um, but test mode on, except that this on the control functions because it's not a, a, a pretend function. For protection functions themselves, we've chosen to stick to um, scheme testing and black box testing without test modes. Um, it's very a lot of the discussions you hear in 61850 edition two, all the test mode functionality. Um, I just question that, ask yourself, when you've toggled that test mode and take it out of the test mode again, how do you know that you're gonna behave exactly the same? If your code is done in PSL logic or flex logic or whichever logic the relay implements, know that that's, been, that, that's gonna work correctly for you. And we couldn't accept that, so. For protection functions, we've based it around the scheme philosophy. You've got a scheme as a whole with multiple IEDs. You wait the complete scheme as a whole. So under frequency load shedding here, um, see it's a very simplified diagram, but hopefully it gets the point across. You've got the VT itself. You've got the isolation links for the VT, for the inputs to the relay. You should isolate your traditional VT input. It's exactly as it would be in service. There's no test modes in there. There's no other bits and pieces of the logic. Um, so you fully test how it's going to be left in service. And on the output, all devices that would act on those OOS messages have a contact that's separately linked. So if you have the under frequency scheme, you go, you do have to go to every under frequency panel and open up that individual link on all the subsequent panels. But allow you to isolate that function as a complete scheme. Um, yeah, enabling that to work was also changing from a single under frequency relay to a check and operate relay. Um, this will send just a single goose message through um, and test functionality or inject differently on different voltage, different frequencies on different inputs to actually test out the complete logic as a thing. That's when you come to designing these is really thinking about how you're going to test these schemes because it's all well and good to program it and get things talking, but it's got something that's easily provable in the field. This is what's seen as a way of um, introduction to the staff in the field of technicians, getting used to the idea of having uh, um, configurations, information on the network that they could look at, they could understand, but they won't necessarily require to suddenly get doable test sets or, in, or get test sets out with laptops, subscribing to messages, trying to uh, um, see edit on test sets. Um, we want to provide that sort of lead, um, stepping stone to future work. Came up against was this discussion about um, the, the 6150 defined information in the doubles from 6150, or using these GIO um, variables for reporting analog uh, reporting sorry um, alarms. The commission started down the path of trying to use the dials that are provided with the relays. Maybe we struck a problem with trying consistent behavior out of all the different relays and the way they've implemented the standard. And here I've shown here of the three of three relays. We tried to just get a simple lagging for a distance element operating. Um, one of our suppliers had, um, uh, let me see, was it? They had two two dis two P dis elements for zone one zone B. They had operation flags for each fault loop in there. Went to zones two four two three four and five. They only had one single P dis element, and it had one single operation flag. So this way, you could only get an A phase B phase C phase flag if it was in a particular zone. 
relay supplier provide the um, different fault loops for the so the separate PDS elements for each fault loop, and you've got an operation flag for each um, fault loop. So regardless of the zone it was in, so that's probably that's not too bad from an individual point of view, but just in those two relays alone, you don't get a consistent alarming behaviour from the relays. One of the things in, that, in the background of our redesign was trying to give a consistent alarms interface to the control room, so um, they can understand how the relays are being programmed in the field to then reinterpret the alarms in the control room. So for using, we, we came to clear to us that using the inbuilt um, the semantic naming inside 61850 wasn't going to work for us. So we end up using logical nodes, um, IO logical nodes with our own um, uh, line. That it's the things that we'd really like to see out of new suppliers is the ability for the um, end user to have some level of configuration of how the information ends up in the 61 logical nodes or some level of standardization on how they are modeled through the standard. To get to that, it's going to be um, as a utility managing many relays across a large network. We want a consistent operating interface to the operators to allow them to make the, the same decisions over and over again, the correct decisions, and to understand the intricacies of how the relays are being set up. Thank you. Just sort of finish up on, on, sorry, one more slide before I get that. Uh, one thing to play very close attention to is um, and the way set it up. One of the big factors of the 61850 is the traffic levels on the network. Um, not so much, not, not too critical in our case because we're just using an under frequency scheme, which isn't particularly critical. It's not duplicated from a point of view, and it's um, just it's got them for lives, obviously. But, but the set bands can have a massive difference on the way the reports are published on the network. We end up with trying to set. Um, if you set it too small, you can have a very high traffic level very quickly. The bits with the rep analog reports end up being relatively large by comparison. Don't pay attention to how they're set. It can be you can make a big difference. Set um, the depth large so that if there was an operating event, like someone turned a feeder on or off, they would actually get a dead band report as a result of that. But I pretty much just relied on the integrity polling once every second or so to actually pick up the analog. Measurement. Uh, to achieve that, it's actually quite difficult because, again, the different manufacturers have different ways of configuring their relays. It's one of the easy traps. Um, it takes a bit of time to really sit down and figure out how the relays have got their dead band reporting. Because everyone just says, oh, it's this percentage dead band and you set it. But is it percentage of the present day, percentage of a maximum minimum defined by manufacturer or by the user, or change in the dead band value, or in this case, there, a change in the primary? Value itself. So, one of the questions I put to the, the comments when I was there was whether that complexity was actually worth it. But, I mean, do we need that ability to set that many different dead bands, or are we all building a relatively system, power, relatively consistent power system, and we could have somehow standardise that a little bit? One point is some of the what we, I guess, we hardly call the undocumented features we came up against. Um, one of the parts of if you're doing the 61850 sort of rollouts is to do your testing um, before you get to the site. We did lab development, a lot of configuration work in the lab, and it paid off for us considerably. Um, things that you wouldn't expect to be, I guess, no, you didn't expect to be bothered with, but I think hardware, firmware, and relays had problems with the TCP connections. Um, some relays did not display the distance of the fault in um, the, the, the numbers that we're after. So we had to, in, they had shown it in their model through 61850, it was available. When you came time to use it, they said, oh, actually, we haven't finished that yet. So we did it through some other way. Okay. So they their re-closing um, into the X control node for the circuit breaker, which is logical in some respects. But for us, we have separate output contacts, one that's a look, SCADA control close and one that's a, um, a reclose close, close function on different links to manage that through our linking practices. So it didn't work for us, and we actually resulted in us having to do a lot of um, outside of that the logic to make it work. 
So it was just an example of some of the troubles we had with it. Um, it really comes down to doing testing up front, and as anyone should be, and um, so good luck with your experiment. I don't know if it's, I just want to throw it out to questions, or was there, what was the plan? Okay. Just a quick question. How long did it took you from start to end to implement this IG sixty L and sixty? So again? How did it take you guys to implement that scheme? Um, we started in twenty eleven. Um the sub's been configured now now. But that's probably more a product of our company process. Um about a good year with the Garda supplier doing we we essentially ended up on their development path for sixty one eight fifty as well. Good year getting our configurations together, getting those to the supplier. They didn't did, then did all their development work for the SCADA system. Um then we verified the configurations against what they implemented and we went back and forth for a little while, but that sort of development time was probably a good year. Okay. You have <coughs> Repeat that again, it just broke up a bit. Uh, you would happen to have a list of relays that you are using for the IG6150? A list of relays? Like models? Can you just go a bit closer to the microphone? It's a bit hard to hear you, sorry. Sorry, we've got a central microphone in the middle of the room. Yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Sorry. Yes, yeah, right. Um, just wondering, like, you happen to have a list of relay they can email to Alex or me to have a bit of a look at? Um, the ones we've included. Yeah, I could probably do that. Um, I don't know if there's any issues with that. Do you have any I don't know, technical pros and cons about them? They're um. Infancy. The biggest thing is figuring out how the relay manufacturers have interpreted the standard. Um, a lot of the relay setting software relies on you understanding how it goes from inside the relay setting software to the C1850 model. Um, so, for example, the Schneider relay is the PSL model, the PSL logic that defines the way it ends up inside the 61850 nodes for the GIO. 90s is actually quite explicit in their configuration. Um, Are using L90? We're using L90s on feeders, and for Siemens, it's their CSC flex logic. So you've got to you've got to understand how they've sort of done that. Some of the manufacturers that haven't got a lot of do documentation around it, so it does take some time to to that out. Yeah, that'd be good if I can have a have a bit of a look at what's going on. Sure. Because we've been through our own little development on the MP3 stuff, that's all. Yeah. Alright. Yeah, I've got a question. Um, is there any remote I.O. that you guys use? Remote I.O. as in for like generic I.O. in the substation? For MIM units. We don't actually have any merging units. This is all, so uh, yeah, we didn't go down that. That's the last step we haven't really gone down. Um, so we've, for any sort of like leftover I.O. in the substation, we just use a, a, a variety of devices to pick up those as sort of bulk I.O. devices. Um, big merging units, yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hi there, it's Herman, yeah. Um, what about just your dripping down to the protection to the breaker and controls, etc., in the field. You still do that through the conventional methods um, by using the inputs and outputs of the protection relays themselves, other than the remote IOs. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So for Sydney, it was all GIS switchgear. Um, so the control room actually had. Uh, sorry, no, it was GIS switchgear. So we had protect. We had um, IEDs um, on the actual switchgear itself. The SCAR system talked to those, but then they were hardwired to the breaker. Um, 
Africa. Um, for our outdoor substations, that all lives in the control room and there's still that hard wiring. We haven't made that step to going to remote IO yet. I think internally we've got some discussion about the life, we still have discussions about the life cycle of those devices living out in the yard. So if anyone's had more experience, we'd be interested to hear about them as well, but we haven't taken that step yet. Well, we have Western Power, we have them installed for what, four years. Um, it, it's working, we haven't had any issues with the life of the IEDs there. The only problem it does add to our cost at the moment, so that's the issue that we're going back and forth whether it's worth it or not. But otherwise, in terms of reliability, after four years we haven't had much issues. Yeah, right. The yeah, big thing for us is that scheme philosophy for us, um, if we're going to implement anything like that, is how do you actually divide, decide to build a testable scheme that works in that regard? But that's interesting. Um, ben, um, two questions here from uh, Transpower. Um, so, what, have you guys started trial the process bus? And also, um, all the relays that you guys are using. Um, I presume it talks uh, 6150 between you, the uh, relay and the RTU. What about from RTU to your master station? Do you talk uh, T3 or uh, 6150? Yeah, as I was saying before, we haven't gone down the process bus route at this stage. Um, so that's our sort of next development path in the future. Um, the communications from the site to head office, it's all still DMP3. Um, the the head office master station, that's its underlying protocol. So the RTUs on site are that protocol gateway. They convert from 61850 to DMP3. Thanks. Yes. Yes, Dr. Office University. Thanks very much. Another question regarding the translator. Could you repeat? Can you re repeat that again? Another question regarding loose isolation that you already mentioned. Yes. In case of, let's say, we don't want to isolate hold the IED, let's say we want to just test the, one of the function blocks like over current protection of the IED. And how did you achieve the isolation of these function blocks? I know that second edition already mentioned some features, but I'm pretty sure your IED doesn't have or doesn't support the Edition of the IEC Yeah, correct. Um, so yeah. We as the, the philosophy is that any function has its uh, every function inside the relay has its own dedicated uh, link, the right. link. So the current trip, the earth fault trip, they're on their own separate over links. So for testing that relay, you can um, take all the other links out, or if you say, if you don't want to affect the over, under frequency, you can under frequency link in service, and then you could open up the overcurrent earth or test link and test that function separately. Right. So, so on that it, scheme, that scheme it, testing philosophy. It, it didn't make it very complex. Your application configuration file. I mean the the logical file. Uh, it didn't make your configuration very com complex. So you're gonna have lots of okay, or switches for each function block. Yeah, it's not too bad so far. It, it does add to the complexity, you're right. Um, I guess one that I didn't touch on there is we didn't actually use any of the um, 61850 engineering tools either. Um, right. We relied on our internal base configuration process. Whenever we get a new... Sorry? Yep. You're right. I was going to say, whenever we get a new relay in Osgrid, we sit down and actually come up with a base configuration, documents every function of the relay, and it's sort of this... Documents about 90% of the settings that we didn't use every single time and don't need to change. So we just need to use like an overcurrent function. All you end up changing is just the pickup and the time levers. You don't need to worry about all that logic because it's been sorted out previously. So for us, it's not too much of a problem. That's understandable. One more question. The, the last question is that when you isolate your, let's say, function overcurrent protection function, or you isolate its goose, and you test this function block, and do you get any response for goose time, time response for goose? Um, did it work? Is is rigged or is that is or not uh, this kind of thing? Um, does the relay report that it operated? Yep. 
So we, we just send the message one way. The other reason we did it with under frequency is it's a very good match for the the goose messaging. Like if you think about the way goose has been set up, it's a one to many broadcast. So under frequency is one of those examples where you usually have only a few devices in the substation that are making the decision, and they broadcast that out to all the other devices, in this case, the feeder panels, and then they make their own internal choice about whether they're supposed to trip on that particular under frequency stage. So it's very much a one directional sort of um, application. There's nothing that's sent back. Thanks, Thanks Ben. No worries. Hi, Spring here from Western Power. I'll just ask you a question. Uh, you mentioned how you're using GeoSkier and the switch, uh, using the the ring on the panel for the GeoSkier. Do you have yeah. sites where yeah. it isn't GeoSkier, and what are your plans for where you're going to locate uh, the relay? In most cases, we end up in them with the protection panels, um, and then you're running the one out to the to the outdoors from there. We saw that as the best sort of compromise, um, just because of the concerns about the longevity of the devices in the yard. If we get something that solves those issues, then we'll probably start looking at something else differently, but that's our process at the moment. How about if you had switch gear? Final oh. stack switch gear that is a GIS. Oh, look, as in indoor, yeah, indoor switch gear? Yeah. We'd do the same thing, yeah, that's right. We'd, do, we'd mount it with the switch gear. Sorry, I'll, for us, it's a GIS or outdoors, so. <laughs> okay. Thanks, mate. No worries. Hello? Hello, this is Akhtar here. Uh, ben, um, how many different manufacturers were used uh, for their IEDs? And uh, my second question is that, was uh, IEC 61850 beneficial? What about five different manufacturers? Um, I don't how, many, how many different IEDs were there? Different there were five IEDs manufacturers, but... Yeah. Five factory is probably about 20 different devices. Um, How many different devices? There's duplicate feeder protection, duplicate trannies, um, multifunction of a current, various I.O. devices, uh, GATA, quite a few in there. So, yeah, it was quite a task to get that sort of coordinated. But the big thing is figuring out the software. So once you've figured out the five manufacturers' software, it's not too bad. That's the second one to your question. The second one is that, do you think that um, uh, interoperability was re reached and was there any advantage of using IEC 61850? Did you get speed advantage or any other advantages besides that? Definitely got a reduction in our... Um, speed of protection. In, in terms of protection, it's not a whole lot of difference. Um, the biggest thing for us was the under frequency, and it does work um, well. And you do get all the benefits from avoiding that um, version from digital to analog and back to digital again. Um, mm -hmm. Frequency, it realizes making the, de the decision digital, digitally. So they process mm -hmm. that and send that information out straight away. You're avoiding translating that back into contact. And then at the end, you're avoiding a relay having to reinterpret the contacts through an analog card and then processing it digitally again. So performance-wise, it works. It is faster. Um, with the network traffic levels in the substation, we did some testing as well, and we we're still seeing um, the performance gains there. See, we saw many gains in terms of the wiring. Like we've in subsequent designs, we probably halved or down to two thirds of the wiring in the substation that we would have run previously. Just a second, condensing all the wiring onto the, the relays and the panels locally. Uh, my, us, yeah. my last question, Ben, is that. Um, uh, the wiring a difficult process or uh, wiring all the five manufacturers' IEDs, was it difficult or was that an easy part or was it done in-house or did you give it to an external person to do all that? We've, presently, we've got internal workshops that do the wiring for us. Um, so that it wasn't a big issue. No, no, us, I'm talking about the wiring diagram, not the actual wiring. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, do all that, that internally. We, yeah, we do that internally. That's the, that's the sort of role I perform now with the guys in the design group. We do our panel wiring and panel layout designs all internally. So. 
you very much, Ben. Uh, ben from Western Power. Um, just a question on the documentation of your Goose Maps. Um, now that you've just hardwiring into Goose Map and how the field want to know what's going on, what method did you guys up for documenting the uh, Goose conflict? Good question. Um, we're relying on the RTIs, the relay test instructions, to hold that configuration information. Um, we, start very, we sort of try to instill some very strong rules around if it's in wiring, if it's in hard wiring, that's something you document on drawing. The full connection of the fibers in the substation is something we've documented through drawing. Come to device configuration, we don't want to re-document that in drawings and then reinterpret again on the RTIs. The real documentation for the configuration of devices is the RTIs themselves. So that's where that's been left at this stage, although it is proving to be a bit... Um, of hard thing for the guys to get used to. Because for example, the under frequency panel, they're seeing T's go into a relay and that's it. There's nothing left for them to see after that. They're sort of wondering what's going on. Um, I think it's just the process of education and um, we'll, we'll probably end up putting some notes on the drawings to say refer to particular RTIs for configuration information or for overall, but it is definitely part of the challenge. Hello, Ben. All right, thanks. Marino here. Sorry. Sorry. Hello, Marino here from Electronet. I, I just wanted to, I just want to ask you a question in relation to um, you know, the distribution of plant status and like you know, isolated status or broker statuses across the uh, across the bay. Um, 61850 or the goose goose you know messaging is of great benefit because you can you know, distribute that across the whole. Um, across all the devices at once. Have you taken any advantage of that or, or do you have directly hardwired contact statuses from plants? We directly hardwired, directly hardwired the statuses directly into the local controller, the local um, ID that's on that panel. Right. The GIS, the, the pallet for the breakers, the isolated statuses are all directly wired. Um, we have any big sort of intertripping schemes that share the information as such or that requires that information. So we haven't had a need to broadcast those directly. They're ordered about, to the SMU and the RTU straight away through reporting, but not through Goose. So for, so for plant, plant interlocking, station interlocking function, they're done at the, uh, the control system area, control system devices up in the top level. Yeah, that's correct, yeah. Okay. No worries. Thanks. Sorry. Sorry. Can you tell us how you enable remote access to the IDs? We don't remote access. <laughs> Record retrieval is done by the IDs publishing to the SMU or the SMU request as the client from relays whether they've got any new fault records. But then when the SMU finds a new fault record, it publishes to the head office from site. Um, no actual remote access right outside to the substations themselves. We've blocked all that access off for cybersecurity and the like. What is that? Prepare to disclose what the brand of RTUs um, you guys are using? I don't am actually, unfortunately. I had a few of those details in the slides and they got pulled out by our um, corporate communications. Um, you can have a discussion offline or something. But I think that we're, we're, it's a fairly common supplier to most New South Wales utilities, so I don't know if that helps. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, hi, Ben. This is Rajneesh from Electronet. Um, just want to ask you, we have implemented 61850. The biggest problems which we face is first is the isolations, and the second one which I want to ask you is that you were designing, have you ever thought that when these substations become brownfield substations, how are you going to the stuff and maintain the stuff? Because that's a huge issue that you're going to verify at the end of the day. It's just a one big project. Uh, all the 61850 components and how you will make sure that the existing components were not actually changed. Yeah, I completely agree. It's a big challenge. Um, so we didn't actually go, 
we, we rely on all the relay manufacturers' software to do the configuration. We haven't brought all the information back together again to make an SED file for that exact reason that we worried about. If you bring it all back together again, how do you know it hasn't in, um, some corruption is in that file and then you're going to roll that back out again. So we rely on our usual setting file processes to just manage those files on a per relay basis. Um, sounds a little bit backward, but I think it's until we get our heads around the way that engineering process works, it's a big challenge. Um, I was recently at the Packworld conference in Glasgow and um, speaking to some of the suppliers there, and they're having big issues where they can't, they built a substation five years ago and they go to back to add one feeder bay, and the supplier won't help them build it because it was built on a previous development version of the standard. Um, so I think as a utility, it's a big thing to consider is how you're going to manage these in future. Um, something that we had in the back of our minds all the way through. That's why we were, just re we were relying on that, that's that real level, just the relay setting software to provide that and our usual relay setting file practices of supplying individual files for relays, getting them documented back as as builds, managing that through the usual sort of um, database management, relay setting database management. That part is okay, but the biggest thing is that the uh, tool which you use for the uh, goose mapping, that will be one tool. You can't have a separate tool for each device or has you done something different. We already have a substation where we actually built five years ago and then go back like a year ago to add a bay in there and we have a lot of challenges there. And yeah, that right. as the substations are bigger and bigger and bigger, would be a huge challenge for everyone to see how we maintain the integrity of the existing system and then add a new bay. Yeah, it's one of the things that I'm I've seen a few implementations where they've talked about a lot of communications going back and forth, especially for t when people try to implement their own test modes. I think that's also some get very messy very quickly. Um, yeah, we, we just rely on the relay setting, the, the relay setting software itself to do that configuration and that setting file management. We um, we don't, and you, you can import and export files from each of the relay setting software's um, tools. You don't need to actually have one integrated tool that does the whole thing. You can do it on a device per device basis. But obviously, okay. it gets a little bit more intensive that way. But what about isolation? How you uh, implemented the device isolation? Is it software, or you put a hardware switch, or like a link, or something? We just rely on that scheme testing philosophy so that if you've got two devices that are talking together, they're treated as a scheme. So you actually go sort of one level outside of that again and you do your isolations on the hardwired parts outside of that scheme. And you do that scheme as a whole. Do You do your black hole oh, okay. testing philosophy as a whole on that scheme. That, that and needs to lose the... Hmm. Pardon? Sorry, sorry. No, nothing. Just... <laughs> If you design your scheme carefully, I think that that, that can pretty much be anything um, you come up with. And but I've got an example concept here where it, that would include that would work for process bus as well. You go, you design it as a scheme that it works as a whole. You test from end to end of the whole scheme. So it means that if you if you have a uh, if you if any of the IDs died in then you have to go back, then you have to take the whole scheme out and retest it. Correct. Okay. But, I, but yeah, that's right. So then you've got to ask yourself, how big do you make your scheme? And how much of the substation can you afford to take out in one go? Or do you take the device out in two parts and sort of match it and pair it up with the primary system? All right. Then, I'll here again. Um, just a question regarding... Uh, the performance you've seen from 61 and 50 um, in terms of clearance times compared to your hardwired solutions. And uh, a tie-in question is regarding schemes like Buson or CBFL, if you've sort of relied on Goose for these sort of schemes as well. We haven't gone that far yet. Um, frequency schemes were performing as well or better than you'd expect from a hardwired scheme. Um, we haven't... All our breaker fails are still done with an external check relay. Um, so that's still on a protection scheme, per protection scheme basis, and there's no um, goose between that. Um, and bar for us is still high impedance bus bar with hardwired tripping, so we haven't implemented that either. The other function itself, the goose, the goose messaging function itself works 
there isn't a doubt that that works. It works well. Um, so. Yeah. Hi, Ben. Uh, uh, ben? Uh, this is Michael from Manager. Just another quick question. Um, where is Osprey going after this? Like in terms of, like you're gonna implement this to existing substation or just new substation only? Um, so far it's only gonna be sort of greenfields that we've done. Um, we've got, we've probably got what now? Probably close to ten or fifteen substations in construction or um, like in the pipeline that'll get this configuration. Um, so there will be quite a few that are done, but they're all on greenfield sort of level. The brownfield's a much harder question because you've got to justify the yeah, additional to, to actually do that change. About trying to implement half a team or something. Uh, brownfield. It's possible. Like for instance, where we've, we've got a few jobs where we're replacing the 11 kV switchboard for a zone. So that new 11 kV switchboard would go in completely. as 61850, all the standard arrangements, but the rest of the substation would still be on its hardwired. Um, so doing some of those schemes like that, but we've got a variety of um, up in the existing RTU on site to become a slave to the new 61850 RTU, um, and other sites are actually installing a whole I/O panel to pick up the existing hardwire. So we are doing some of those actually. So. Hi, uh, this is Jimmy Chong from Test Network. Uh, just like to check, are you actually doing any field aggregation in your network? Um, we are, but not for the reason you might think. Um, so if I go back to the, uh, if you can still see the screen, I'll, sure. um, I'll go back to the network arrangement. Reasons of segregate the VLANs for the protection's sake because the networks themselves are physically separate. Um, the thing we do have is to actually separate out the goose messaging from the MMS traffic, so as a management level for the switches. Um, so we pr we've put the devices actually have to live on essentially what they call, what Cisco have termed trunk ports. It's on uh, goose messages on a variety of VLANs, and you've got to have the switch able to interpret that tagging of the messages. So the goose messages are on their own VLAN, which is the highest priority. Um, the MMS traffic in the background is on a lower VLAN with a lower priority. And it, it, we've got one VLAN outside of that that's a management VLAN to allow you to configure the switches. Yes, that's Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your time. Glad to share it with you.